Okay, so my name is uh, Hitesh Oberoi. I run a company called InfoEdge. Maybe you are not familiar with InfoEdge, but perhaps you are more familiar with uh, Nokri.com, 99acres.com, JeevanSathi.com. These are some of our brands. And of course, we've been around uh, for over 25 years as a company. And uh, over the last few years, we've also invested in a ton of startups. So we have over investments in over 65 startups as we speak today. Some of the better known ones are Zomato and Policy Bazaar. We were the first investors in Zomato. We were the first investors in Policy Bazaar back in 2008. So that's to just give you a sense of the company. So Nokri is 25 years old. Nokri started life in 1997. At a time when there was hardly any venture capital available in the country. At a time when there were hardly any internet users in the country. Of course, today Nokri is, uh, generates an EBITDA of, uh, cash EBITDA of 300 crores a quarter on the average, right? So that's how big Nokri has become over the years. So it's one of uh, India's uh, very, very few, but very, very profitable internet. Now, no longer a startup, but internet company. And of course, our second largest business is 99 Acres. Again, doing very well, a leader in the real estate space, uh, getting close to break even. Uh, and like I said, we've also been investing in startups. So what I'm, the topic of, uh, for today, uh, is how are CEOs driving growth in this uh, uncertain sort of global environment, right? Uh, things have changed a lot uh, over the last few years. Uh, the world is no longer what it used to be. But before I get into all this, I just want to get a sense of the audience here. How many people here work for companies? Work for companies, mid-sized companies or large companies. How many people run their own startups? Okay, so this is primarily a startup audience, but people who are already entrepreneurs. Uh, the focus of my talk is going to be mostly uh, on how to sort of get innovation going in a startup. Because once you've established yourself, once you've survived as a startup, how do you grow? You know, how do you handle, how, how do you manage challenges of scale? How do you get innovation going, more importantly than anything else, in a, inside a company, right? Because in the beginning, startups are all about founders. Startups are all about entrepreneurs. The entrepreneur makes things happen. He's the one who leads from the front. He gets everyone together. He raises capital. He goes and sells. He hires people. You know, he builds a product along with maybe his co-founders. But after a while, you need the system to work. You know, you need uh, the setup to work if you have to grow because otherwise you can very quickly get stuck. At Sometimes you get stuck at the 1 crore mark. Sometimes you get stuck at the 10 crore mark. Sometimes you get stuck at the 100 crore mark. But you can get stuck as a company. So how do you get, you know, growth going uh, inside a large setup? is going to be the focus of my talk. But before that, you know, just a few slides on where we are today, you know, because this is supposed to be a CEO talk and not just a startup talk. So let me just tell you uh, a little bit about what we are seeing from our vantage point and from where we are today. See, the world has uh, changed dramatically in the last few years. The change, you know, it started in 2008 uh, with the global financial crisis. Maybe uh, some of you uh, uh, had not set up companies by then, but we saw uh, you know, Nokri for a long time grew like crazy and, you know, there was a point in time and we were doubling revenue every year and we were very profitable and suddenly we were hit by the global financial crisis in 2008 and overnight, you know, we went from growing at 40-50% per annum to declining at 25% per annum. So from 50% growth, we went to minus 25% for a few quarters. Uh, so that was the first time we saw real recession uh, in India. Of course, things recovered within a few quarters and we were back on track, but that was our first brush with what a real recession is like. Fast forward 10 years, 12 years, you know, we got COVID um, in 2019, 2020. And again, you know, uh, for a couple of quarters, but in fact for three quarters, there was a point in time when the 99 acres business was down 70%, right? So from growing at 20% per annum or 25, it was minus 70 for a couple of quarters. And the Nokri business was minus 50, right? So for two quarters, we saw minus 50% growth in Nokri. So that's how bad things were uh, in 2020. Fast forward one year, fast forward one year, 2021, and the Nokri business was growing like fire. It was growing like it had never grown before. It was, you know, it was growing like a startup. So suddenly from minus 50, we were back to 80%, 100% growth in Nokri on a high base. So that's the point I'm trying to make is the markets have been very, very choppy. The economy has been very, very choppy. The world has uh, become a very uncertain, a very unpredictable place. 
uh, as we speak again, today as we speak, again, you know, the IT services sector has slowed down. Um, you know, startup, the startup world is going through its own sort of pangs. Uh, there was crazy funding available for startup till two years ago. I mean, companies were raising 100 million, 200 million, 500 million dollars. Today, there's a, there's a funding winter, right? So the world has become very unpredictable, it's become very uncertain. Uh, governments also globally are thinking very differently from how they were thinking a few years ago. Take the US for example, the US wants to build a manufacturing industry, right? So they're investing in manufacturing, unheard of, right? Uh, till some time back. Uh, because they want to create jobs for people who've got left behind by globalization. Uh, climate change, I mean, we are seeing uh, what climate change is doing uh, everywhere, right? Uh, the kind of rains we saw in Delhi. I mean, you are seeing such uh, climate incidents everywhere in the world. And especially in the developed world, there is a race to sort of, uh, you know, adopt uh, greener technologies and as quickly as possible. And this, is gonna, this is gonna have a huge impact on the energy sector and many other industries going forward. Uh, and governments also want to enhance national security after the war uh, in Europe and given what's happening with China, and the China plus one thing you must be hearing about, every company, every country wants to sort of protect or develop, you know, uh, core sort of uh, uh, industries which are important for national security, right? And so you're seeing a lot of that stuff happening in every country as well. Uh, and inflation, you know, is new unknown, right? Because, uh, you know, we grew up, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, you know, and at that time, inflation in India should be 10, 12, 14% per annum. Fast forward 2000s, 2010s, we got used to 6, 7% inflation. The developed world, for as long as I can remember, America never saw more than 1 or 2% inflation, 2%, maybe 3% at max. Today, many parts of the developed world are seeing 7%, 8%, 10% inflation, 5% inflation, 6% inflation. As a result, of which interest rates have gone up because that's how you bring demand down. As a result, result of which suddenly those markets have become very, very attractive for investment, right? And which is why you saw a lot of money flowing out of developing markets into developed markets. Because suddenly, if you can get 5% or 6% on a 10-year bond, why do you want to take equity market risk? Which is what led to the stock market correction. Uh, in, in many parts of the world. So the world is a changed place uh, and business has never been as uncertain and, and as unpredictable as it has become recently. Now, in my view, there's one other big unknown and, and that is uh, technology change and adoption, right? And that's also accelerating. Uh, 25 years ago, you got the internet or 30 years ago, you got the internet and then Google, and you got Search, and some of these companies became very big. Then you got uh, the social networking gang, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, all these companies became very big. Uh, then you saw a huge migration uh, towards smartphones as smartphone technology became ubiquitous, and now everybody has a smartphone, um, and you got 4G, and then now you have 5G. So, and now, you know, you have AI and machine learning and chat GPT to grapple with, again. So every few years, you see something or the other coming up and uh, it sets the, you know, sort of trend. And, uh, uh, you know, companies that are not able to adapt to the changing technology world get left behind, right? So it's a very important lesson for all of us to understand that if you're not able to uh, use new technology, if you're not able to leverage new technology in your business, uh, in your way of working, over time, you'll get left behind, and I'll, that's, been, that's the focus of my presentation, and I'll talk about it a little more. And people ask us all the time, yeah, nokri has been a leader for 25 years, how have you guys done it? There's so much money just come in, so many startups, et cetera, et cetera, but Nokri continues to have 60, 70%, 80% share of the market. So how have you guys done it? And the answer to that is we've been constantly investing in technology, we've been constantly investing in creating a culture which motivates people uh, to stay with us and give their best. And we've been constantly investing in, in, uh, in getting the right talent uh, into our company, right? Uh, so in my view, I cultivating an innovation mindset, you know, at the top of an organization. So any of people here who are running startups or who work for large companies or who work for mid-sized companies, uh, innovation will mean different things in, to different people and to different companies, but it's very important that we all cultivate an innovation mindset if we have to 
thrive. I mean, forget thrive, you have to even survive uh, in the world going forward. And so what does it mean and how do you, and why is it important and how do you cultivate that mindset? I'll talk about that for the next 10, 15 minutes. Uh, I touched upon this briefly. Today, if you include Tesla or maybe, and maybe Nvidia, seven or eight of the 10 companies, top 10 companies in the world are tech companies, right? It's Google, Microsoft, Meta, Nvidia, Tesla, Apple, I mean, and there are now trillions of, the market cap is in trillions of dollars. So maybe the top 10 companies between them are worth $10 trillion. There was not a single trillion dollar company around till a few years ago. So the world is not ruled by the oil companies, it is not ruled by the pharma companies, it is not being, it's not ruled by the consumer companies, it's not being ruled by banks and financial services companies anymore, it's all tech, right, at the top, right? That's how important tech has become over the last few years. Uh, and the pace of change is only accelerating, right? So the biggest hotel company today is perhaps Airbnb. It's not, the, it's not a regular hotel company, right? The biggest media company is Google or maybe YouTube, which is owned by Google. Uh, the biggest entertainment company is not a TV company. It's Netflix, right? Uh, the biggest news company in the world today is perhaps Twitter. All of us get our news from Twitter now, right? The biggest gaming company is Microsoft, right? So the biggest car company, rental company is Uber, right? So, and the biggest retailer is no longer Walmart, it's Amazon, right? So, so Look, everywhere, every industry, every sector is being disrupted by a technology-first company, by a company which has been, which is constantly innovating, uh, which has been adopting the latest technology, and so on. Biggest music company is Spotify. Biggest car company now, Tesla. Tesla is bigger than the next five car companies put together, right? And does not even exist in India. So that's how things have changed. Uh, the stock market, the biggest sort of uh, mutual funds are not run by human beings, they're run by machines. Quantitative trading, everywhere in the world has become very, very large. So tech driven, tech first, data first, digital first businesses often combined with, you know, all these data driven insights from AI and machine learning, etc. They, they over time develop economies of scale, they over time develop strong network effects and become bigger than everybody else. That is what we've seen over the last 20 years, and that is what is likely to play out for the next 10 or 20 years as well. Having said so, all is not lost for the non-tech companies, companies which are non-tech, uh, but have been able to adapt uh, to the changing world, have been able to survive, and there are some good examples of that. Um, the Economist, a publication which has been around for many years, they now have a beautiful app, uh, they, you know, they perhaps have more subscribers uh, on their app than of that physical sort of magazine they publish today, right? So they managed to survive and thrive in, the, in this uh, rapidly changing world because they adopted technology. Closer home, you know, I, I have been a big user of the ICICI Bank app for many years, and uh, they've done a wonderful job, and they were at it early, and they continue to invest behind their online sort of offerings, and if they do that, it'll be hard to displace them, right? And now Walmart. And Disney, you know, these are two big companies that have been around forever, and they are very, very aggressive. Walmart has acquired Flipkart in India, right? So a big American retailer, they are not setting up physical stores in India. They're not doing that. That's what they did in the US. They acquired Flipkart, right? A Walmart Labs in Bangalore employs thousands of engineers who work on, you know, uh, all the digital stuff they do in the US. So, there are countless examples of companies who have invested, cultivated an innovation mindset, and who have survived and thrived. And at the same time, there are many examples of companies who could not adapt, adapt and have disappeared from the scene. So Nokia, Blackberry, Sony, Kodak, Blockbuster, Barnes & Nobles, many newspapers and TV channels, many of these names, household names we grew up with, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, no longer exist. The other point I want to make is, the, see, the, uh, the answer to many of the problems facing the world today is actually technology, right? So if you want to solve for climate change and global warming, if you want to solve for hunger, cancer, disease, you know, uh, you know uh, if you want to solve for uh, financial inclusion, if you want to solve for universal education at low cost, right, because education becomes so expensive over the years, if you want to solve the obesity problem, the health problem, the answer is technology. 
the answer to all these problems facing mankind today lies in sort of new technologies and building new businesses and new business models to leverage these technologies, some of which already exist and some of which will become viable over the next few years. So many new technologies are on the horizon, thanks to all the investments which has uh, gone into sort of uh, uh, startups and, and building new technologies and research over the years. And you combine them with big ideas and old problems, and you get innovative companies. And this is where the opportunity lies for both startups and existing companies. And there are many implications. Uh, result, as a result of all this, software is, uh, is eating the world. Today, 50% today, of the jobs on, on Nokri.com are for techies, whether you like it or not. Okay, 50% of the jobs, white collar jobs in these countries are for people in tech or digital, if you want to sort of expand. Increasingly, we are seeing a lot of jobs on the side for AI, because the one school of thought is that software aid the world and AI will eat software, right? So it's important uh, to understand where the world is heading. Um, and machines, people say, often people say, did away the, with the lead for manual labor, and AI may, do, may, away, may do away with the lead for low-end cognitive labor. So we need to be aware of what's happening and where the world is heading. Certain kinds of jobs will not exist going forward. At the same time, there will be opportunities for, uh, uh, in a lot of new sort of startups and industry and, and sort of um, companies for AI developers, machine learning developers, data modelers, and the likes, digital sort of, or anything, anything to do with digital. So this is where it's all headed. 50% of the jobs on Nokri. You know, at the peak, it was 62%. Even non-IT companies, you know, banks, financial services companies, accounting companies, they're hiring IT folks today, right? That's what, that's how fast things are changing on the ground. This, for India, this means a unique opportunity because, uh, like I said, India can leapfrog. You know, India did not ever have landlines. We moved to mobile phones straight away, and in fact, we moved to smartphones now. Uh, and, which is, and the government understands this, which is why the government is sort of you know, investing or sort of they keep talking about digital India, startup India, make in India, China plus one. These are the buzzwords today because that's where the opportunity is going forward. All these new green technologies and so on and so forth. And Asia, the, the last thing I want to make is Asia is fast becoming the center of gravity, right? Um, you know, if you go to Dubai and, and, and Singapore today, they are the new hotspots uh, in this part of the world. Uh, so there's a lot of action in Asia and in the US. The rest of the world, it's almost as the rest, and China, of course. So there's China, and then the rest of Asia, and then the, and there's the US. And it's almost as if the rest of the world doesn't count anymore. Innovation also means a massive wealth creation opportunity. The Indian stock market today is three and a half trillion. Fast forward 10, 15 years, you know, if India continues to grow at 5% per annum, we, are, we now have a high base, right? If we continue to grow at this rate for the next 10, 15 years, you know, the Indian stock market cap will be 10, 15 trillion dollars. So more wealth, maybe three times more wealth will be created in the next 10, 15 years than has been created in the last 75 years, if you think about it. So if three and a half goes to 10, 15 trillion, and that's what all the stocks are going to be worth, you know, you can imagine the wealth creation opportunity, right? Uh, and what this also means is that perhaps India will have a few hundred billionaires, and India will have tens of new startups which are going to get listed. We already saw a lot of companies getting listed last year, Zomato, Policy Bazaar, Nika, Paytm, and the likes. And there's a whole pipeline of companies getting ready to list. And once that happens, you know, and investors see the success of the Indian startup scene, more investment will follow. There'll be ups and downs, you know, there'll be, you know, all that will happen, that's part of the game. But this is the long-term trend, this is where it's all headed. So the question therefore is then, so why don't we see more innovation in companies? And many of you run startups here and you will realize it's not easy to innovate. And why is it not easy to innovate and what will it take to innovate is what I will spend the next maybe three, four, five minutes on. And I will basically share some learnings from our InfoEdge experience. It's not easy to innovate and these slides are a little heavy, right? Uh, because many things hold companies back, right? Uh, often companies don't believe in innovation. Uh, they've tried in the past and given up and they say, humne koshish ki thi. Right? Uh, it's risky, innovation is risky, and I mean, not all innovation is going to succeed, so you know, a lot of ideas fail, you know. Uh, companies often don't have the skills and talent to innovate, so like I said, once they are done with the founder, at the found, all talent stops at the founder, after that is very hard. So they don't have their skills and talent, they're always dependent on the founder to innovate, founders can't think of all the ideas, 
right? So innovation requ therefore requires investments and resources. And um, also what happens, what I've seen over time is that once companies become successful, they become complacent. Hey, yaar, hamara ho gaya, ab to hum set ho gaye, ab we can take it easy, right? So, and before you know, you know, for a few years they take it easy and then suddenly they get a jolt, right? They get disrupted. Uh, so innovation is risky, innovation is expensive, but not innovation, not innovating is even riskier. It's even more expensive in the long run. Uh, and you know, many companies are able to invest in what I call incremental innovation. Choti choti chizne karte rehte hain, but they shy away from doing big disruptive things because that's even harder, right? And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concept of innovator's dilemma. Anybody here familiar with innov innovator's dilemma as a concept? Okay. So, you know, innovator's dilemma basically kya hai ke, see, in innovation is expensive, innovation takes time. And when you want to do something disruptive, you know, often uh, you end up destroying the business model you already have, right? So for that reason, companies shy away. If the economist, which you know, wants to move customers away from physical to offline, online, you know, they'll end up hurting their physical revenue, right? For a long time, therefore, they shy away. They say, "Yeah, margin come hoga, paise bhi lagenge, it'll hurt my existing business. So why should I innovate?" And that's a big mistake because somebody else will then come and take your cake away, right? So it's not as if so you know, if today, car companies, uh, you know, say, "Listen, we're not going to build electric cars." Because electric cars are disruptive, you know, because you have to have, invest in a whole ecosystem to get electric cars going. You know, sooner or later, everybody, somebody's going to eat their cake. We're already seeing that, right? So disruptive innovation for reasons like innovator's dilemma is, already, is always harder. You think that my business will be affected by that. But if you don't do it, then someone else will do it. Often, you know, management, once companies get managers, they become corporatized, you know, and they hire, uh, you know, professionals. They, fail to incentivize them to innovate. You know, they're often judged mostly on quarterly targets, annual target, while innovation takes time. So, you know, you need to understand that if you don't create a system which encourages people to innovate, you will not see innovation, right? So that's the, this is some of the reason why innovation is very hard in, in companies. Uh, and therefore, we, we realize that at InfoEdge, it's not as if we have solved the problem. But we realize that, we are aware, and that when, when you're aware, that's half the battle won. And we are trying very hard to sort of create a culture which, you know, and to do a few things which get innovation going inside and Like I told you, we are also 25 years old as a company. So 25 years ago, I was 27 years old, 27 years old, now I'm 51 years old, right? I continue to be. So, but how do you get young people in? How do you create a culture which uh, gets people to stay and to think long term and, and to build new things? Uh, so it starts with, you know, hiring people with a can-do attitude, right? So when companies grow, you, know, you need two kinds of people in my view. You need senior managers, and that's what people acknowledge and understand. I need a sales head, I need a marketing head, I need a CTO. I, they understand all that. And they get busy hiring those people. And to get these people in and to settle them down, etc., is very, very hard, as we all know. And often you go wrong. Uh, but at the same time, you need young talent. You need People who are curious, you need people who are dynamic, you need people with a can-do attitude, you need people who are, who are aspirational, you need people who get all the new stuff that's happening uh, in the world today. And therefore, you have to constantly induct new talent in the company at all levels. And you have to invest in upskilling existing talent, which people already in the company. Hain. You know, and some people, many, peop many people here are entrepreneurs, and we all know that, you know, in the beginning, um, there are people who play a very big role in getting the company to where it is today, but often some of these people are not able to keep pace with the changing sort of environment. They're not able to upgrade their skills. They sometimes get left behind, uh, and it can be very, very hard for them if you don't invest in their upskilling, right? Uh, and uh, if you don't, and they can get upset about the fact that you're hiring new people and not upskilling them internally, right? So we need to sort of balance both. And you need to promote good leaders inside the company. Doesn't have to be senior people, right? But anybody who shows leadership skills, I think should be pushed up. Uh, so that's the first thing, you know, this, this some, these are some of the things we believe in at InfoEdge and we've done successfully over the years. Uh, the other thing we believe is, is in running an open culture, right? It's very important. We understand, in fact, we, we know that some, not all the best ideas will come from people at the top. 
So as a culture, we are not hierarchy driven, right? We are ideas driven, we are data driven. If you have data, you have an idea, if it makes sense, no matter who you are in the company, we are happy to support it. Right? It doesn't have to be that the idea will come from the CEO only, or from the CFO only, or from the CTO only. Uh, in fact, I tell them, boss, your job is to get the best ideas. Right? Not produce all the best ideas. Which is, there's a big difference in getting the best ideas and thinking of all the best ideas. Uh, the ideas can come from anywhere. Ideas can come from competition. Ideas can come from an event like this. You check out some of these stalls. You may, it may just sort of fire something in your brain. Yeah, I need to do this. Ideas can come from new people you hire. Ideas can come from data which you analyze, right? So it's important that you have a bottom-up uh, culture as well in addition to a top-down culture. Every company has a top-down culture. It's a little bit of right? But it's important to create this bottom-up culture inside organizations. Uh, the third thing I have learned over the years, and this I have learned especially in the last few years, this is very important to break down silos. What happens in a growing company, and now you have started a growing, shuru shuru mein sab log milke kar rahe hote and they're fighting the same battle, and they want to solve a customer problem, and it's about survival. But the moment you cross that hump, you know, departments start getting created. Ab ye sales ke log ho gaye, ye marketing ke log ho gaye, ye tech ke log ho gaye, ye finance ke log ho gaye. And these silos get created, and then sooner or later communication stops between silos and people start operating in their own sort of freedoms. Now, that's not important, that's not great for innovation. Uh, a customer doesn't care how you're set up internally. He wants his problem solved, right? So, it's important when, to, to innovate. What we've learned is it's important to create diverse cross-functional teams, right? Uh, to solve complex problems. It's very difficult for one guy to get everything. But the moment you create a team, and of course the team needs a good leader, uh, you find that you are thoda marketing se samjha, thoda yaan se samjha, thoda waan se samjha, and then you get the full problem. And then you are able to find a solution. If you operate in silos, if you don't involve functions, uh, different functions in the innovation sort of uh, uh, team, it, it can get harder. You may end up solving the wrong problem, or you may not find a solution to a problem. Uh, so, you need to get rid of bureaucracy, you need to get rid of silos, you need lean teams, not very big teams, uh, but you need, you need cross-functional teams, often. You know, often you need a guy from ops, a design ka banda a tech ka banda a ops ka banda a sales ka banda and Then you tell them, listen, you fail together, you succeed together, right? So you're in it to solve this problem. And to create this kind of uh, setup inside a company is not easy, because like I said, there are functions and there are bosses who run those functions. Uh, but if you want to innovate, it's important. Uh, and last but not, and, sort of, and, and some more points, discipline. A disciplined approach to innovation is also uh, important. Innovation has to be business first, not innovation for the sake of innovation. Right? I'm doing something, technology, which is not relevant for business. I don't think we've reached that point in India as yet, where we can just have innovation for the sake of innovation. No space for free freeloaders, people who bide their time, who are not interested, um, who are not happy to collaborate, who don't take accountability, you know, I mean, they should not be in the innovation sort of setup of any company. And it's important to have frank conversations because uh, it's important to solve the problem. Frank conversations, candid discussions are important if you want to solve the problem. Uh, and then, in general, if you want to promote a culture of innovation in a company, you have to have tolerance for failure. Right, you have to give people a safe space. If everyone is scared, if my project fails, if I get out of it, if my promotion is lost, if my this is lost, that is lost, then nobody is going to take up the challenge. Nobody is going to raise their hand and say, I will innovate. Everybody will want to work in an existing business, in a business just doing well, where all the money comes from. Nobody will take a risk. You have to provide people with a safe space uh, to innovate. And of course, uh, when you get innovation, you should be able to reward innovation handsomely. Otherwise, why will people take the risk? I mean, disproportionate risk should result in disproportionate rewards. So if you want to promote a culture of innovation in a company, people who are willing to raise their hand, take chances, take the risk, should be rewarded disproportionately than people who are only willing to work in safer environments. Right? And these are some of the things we do inside, in, some of the tools we use inside InfoEsh to encourage innovation. Uh, you know, we have Friday sessions where people discuss what is the new stuff that they're doing inside the company. We have cross-functional boards, which we set up uh, in areas where we want to innovate. Uh, we have, annu annually, we have a merit award ceremony 
so we have a big function every year where we call lots of senior leaders and we reward people uh, who were successful at innovation uh, and at moving the needle forward during the year. Uh, uh, you know, we, um, it's very important to be in touch with your customers if you want to innovate. Uh, so in some of our businesses, we organize market days, customer days, where everybody goes to the market on those days to learn from customers. Because like I said, ideas can come from anywhere. Some of our best ideas have come from customers. Uh, we also keep an eye on the startup world, you know, to see what's happening in the startup world. So I have a corporate development team which reports to me. Uh, over the last few years, we've acquired a few startups. We've invested in many more for our operating business. One is the financial investments we do, like I mentioned, Zomato policy. Those are for financial reasons. But for our own businesses also, jobs, real estate, matrimony. We've, over the last few years, we've acquired a dating company. We've acquired a recruitment software company. we acquired IM jobs. we acquired a bunch of such companies. And we've invested in a few more to understand what's happening in the world outside, right? And like I said, we incentivize people with special rewards and special ESOPs uh, when they do uh, innovative work or when they uh, raise their hand and say, I will build a new business. So today we have, you know, we are building a new blue collar job board inside, in, uh, it's called Job Hai, right? Uh, it's uh, getting good traction. We put together a team for the same and we're gonna reward that team differently from other teams if they succeed because otherwise why would somebody give up naukri and say my job at my kaam right? So these are some of the things we understand uh, and, uh, uh, and as a result, you know, we've seen massive transformation inside InfoEdge in three areas, talent, uh, technology and culture, right? And as a result of this, our business has got transformed over the years. So today, you know, we are five and a half thousand people we have about 1,100, 1,200 people working in what we call core product development, uh, technology, data science, machine learning, UX, product management, these kind of roles. Um, we've got uh, a strong leadership layer now. You know, there are, of course, founders and promoters, but under them, we have another 40, 50, 60 people from some of the best institutes in the country who run our various businesses, who run our various functions. Um, you know, earlier, we were mostly a tenure-based company, now we are a two meritocracy. You know, that's how we've transformed over the years. So you could be somebody with just two years in the company, and you could be doing better than somebody who spent 10 years in the company, by the way. So that happens often at InfoEdge. Uh, and uh, uh, like I said, we have now young people who run ventures inside the company. So often people who raise hands are young people because they have aspirations, you know, uh, they want to grow, they want to make some, do something with their lives. Uh, and, and at the heart of all this is our core belief that, listen, it's all about people. Yeah? In the end, at the end of the day, we are not a very capital intensive business. We are not building hotels. We are not building flyovers and we don't do any capex. It's all about ideas. It's all about technology. It's all about creating a culture, the right culture. And for that, you need the right people. And you need them to uh, think, you know, give their 110% at work, right? And you want them to sort of think big and, you know, and be around for a long time because the other thing you have to understand is that you cannot build anything if people come and go every two years, right? You think our cost is less, but if you want to build something long-lasting, if you want to build something for the long term, you have to have people who are around for at least 10, 10 years, 15, 15 years in your company. So you have to create a culture which sort of, uh, you know, uh, incentivizes that. Uh, all the stuff we've done in technology. I will give you, tell you a short story. Till 2005, in Nokri, we had a three people technology team, two, three people in technology. We had zero people in product development. We had zero people in UX design. We did not even understand how important it was, how powerful these things could, have, could be for us. We did not invest in them early, right? Over time, we learned and we built these teams, right? So in the beginning, it was all about sales. Sales karo, yaar, kis paise leo? <laughs> because it's all about survival. And at that time, there was not much venture capital funding also available. So we had to manage with what we had. Total money raised to build Nokri.com, seven crores. That's it. Right? Only one round of funding in 2000. A month after we got funded, there was a dot-com bust. We were not able to raise money ever after. We had to break even and manage with whatever we had. And we put a lot of energy into sales and, you know, one or two products which we were building at that time. And everything else took a back seat. But after a while, when we became profitable, we realized that this is very necessary if you have to grow. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, it's very, very hard. Today, the Nokri business is about 2,000 crores, just the Nokri business makes a 1,200 crore bidda. That's what it made last year. Uh, but it's managed to sort of survive and scale and stay on top because we've constantly been investing in new areas. 
So we invested in search and scalability. We invested in mobile in a very big way. And for the last five years, people, people have started talking about AI now. We've been investing in AI for the last six, seven years now. Right? And now we are you know, setting up a gen AI, generative AI team as well. So we are doing mostly machine learning and deep learning and some of those algorithms still now. We have a 62, 66 people strong AI and machine learning team at InfoEdge, right? Uh, it's been built painstakingly over the last five, six years. Uh, so this is, and this is therefore, you know, like I said, this is the history. The, comp the transformation we went through on the technology side, on the people side, and that led to the business also transforming itself over the years. So this is, somebody asked me once, you know, as a CEO, how did you deal with the highs and lows at InfoEdge? So this is what came to my mind, so put it here, right? Uh, we've seen two big recessions, one small one, uh, seen big competition from Google, Monster, LinkedIn, Indeed, AI. In the early days, we had to deal with a lot of big companies in India who were very aggressive, and even now. But what has really worked is focus on the problem, focus on the customer, focus on people, focus on long-term investors, and focus on doing things right. And if you just... If you don't get distracted, if you do all these things, there'll be ups and downs, but in the end, because you will solve the problem right for the customer, right, things work out. You get distracted, you try solving the problem for the investor, if you're trying to solve the problem for somebody else, you're bound to fail. In the end, you have to make money from customers and you have to solve their problem. If you solve their problem without getting distracted, without losing focus, everything else follows. But increasingly, like I said, to do this, you need to invest in people, culture, and technology. That is at the heart of all this, especially if you're a tech-first company. And it's not easy, it gets expensive every year, but you have to be at it. Right? With that, I'll stop. If there are questions, I'm happy to take them. I don't know how much time we have. Yes, uh, do we have time? Do we have time? Okay, one or two questions only? Okay, thank you. Hello, sir. Yes. Thank you so much for your valuable words. Uh, you wrote there, have unreasonable goals. Sorry? Have unreasonable yes, goals. Yes, yes. What's the meaning of that? Unreasonable goal. See, when you're doing something new, so what, it's very easy. What I've seen in our company also, after a while, what happens? Right? When you are a small company, you think, yeah, I have to do 1 crore, right? But after you do 1 crore, you can set a 1.5 crore target for yourself for next year, or you can set a 1.2 crore target, or you can say, I want to be 10 crores in two years, right? Now, I think 10 crores in two years is what you should be aiming for. If very quickly you fall into this it trap of KR... It should be realistic. It should be realistic, achievable also. Realistic, achievable. Achievable, achievable, but sometimes it's a mindset thing, right? People fall in this trap, they become complacent. But if you don't aim for something high, how will you even get there? It forces you to think differently. I am not saying it should be the target for your sales team. But as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, as a founder, you have to think big. And you know, if you don't, if you don't, the danger is that you will get complacent, you will become happy with 8-10% growth. And Sooner or later, you will fall back. Be not satisfied. Yes. Yes. एक चीज और सर कि अगर हम अपनी टीम को इतना सिखा दें, इतना सिखा दें, तो वो हमें छोड़के भी तो चली जाती है दूसरी जगह पे. Correct. और ये और अगर हमें नहीं और अगर हमें नहीं सिखाया. It is a big problem for us. I agree. But एक an even bigger problem in my view is आपने सिखाया नहीं और वो आपके साथ ही रह गए. नहीं. ठीक है. तो फ in my view, people leave because... Behind this question, there was another question. How to build a core team, honest team. Honest, core, long-lasting. Correct. So, I wanted to ask this. 
तो ये बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट स्ट्रेच स्पेशली इन स्टार्टअप राइट एंड थी देखो इसमें दो तीन चीज़ें हैं वॉट आई हैव सीन इन माई इन माई ट्वेंटी फाइव ईयर्स इज दैट इन द बिगनिंग इन द बिगनिंग यू नीड पीपल हु आर लाइक माइंडेड ऑफ एन यू नीड पीपल हु नो ईच अदर राइट बिकॉज हाउ विल यू नो दैट दे लाइक माइंडेड अदरवाइज राइट सो यू सी अ लॉट ऑफ स्टार्टअप वर्ल्ड वाइड यू नो दे स्टार्ट बाई टू फ्रेंड्स इन स्कूल और टू पीपल हु न्यू ईच अदर और थ्री पीपल गॉड लॉन्ग वेल सेट्रा एसेट्रा और इवन इन्फोसिस दे वर ऑल टूगेदर इन द सेम कंपनी एंड दे लेफ्ट एंड स्टार्ट इन्फोसिस राइट सो यू नीड पीपल हु आर इन इट फॉर द लॉन्ग रन हु यू नोन फॉर अ लॉन्ग टाइम हु यू थिंक ऑफ एन हैव कॉम्प्लीमेंट्री स्किल्स कि इफ योर स्ट्रेंथ इज ए बी सी देर स्ट्रेंथ इज एक्स वाई जी एंड बोथ आर रिक्वायर फॉर द कंपनी टू सक्सीड एंड हु आर विलिंग टू स्टिक इट आउट राइट सो ऑफ एन दीज आर पीपल हु आर नोन टू यू बट समटाइम्स यू नॉट एबल टू गेट सच पीपल राइट सो देन यू हैव टू वर्क एक्स्ट्रा हार्ड टू गेट दैम दी अदर थिंग यू हैव टू कीप इन माइंड इज दैट यू नीड टू इंसेंटिवाइज दैम राइट राइट सो अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल कंपनीज इन इंडिया शेयर शाई अवे फ्रॉम शेयरिंग वेल्थ राइट सो अगर आप इम्प्लॉज ले रहे हो यू शुड हैव एन अट्रैक्टिव ईस ऑफ प्लान राइट इफ यू आर गेटिंग को फाउंडर्स यू नीड टू इंश्योर दैट दे हैव द राइट अमाउंट ऑफ इक्विटी टू स्टे इन द कंपनी फॉर द लॉन्ग रन सो दीज थिंग्स आर वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट यार यू हैव टू गेट दम राइट इन द बिगनिंग इट सेल्फ बिकॉज अदरवाइज बिकॉज वेरी डिफिकल्ट थैंक यू या सॉरी लास्ट क्वेश्चन Uh, good afternoon, sir. Okay. Hi, this is Ankit. I am from Ruj Healthcare. I am head of engineering, so I am handling a team of technical. So I am very much pissed off with some of the people who spread negativity in your uh, different verticals about the you can say about your team and defaming your team image. or doing the office politics to so how to deal with that kind of person you know the acoustics is not so good i couldn't understand the question i okay. can't hear it clearly here okay so my question is that like i'm handling a technical team technical and team. yeah okay so i have 5 to 10 employees there 5 to 10 employees yeah. okay i have a different vertical of marketing that is uh, you can say the person is just in in the same uh, position which i am holding so every time uh, like the department is uh, creating a negativity like or uh, they are doing the office politics so how can we handle that kind of things office politics you said yeah <laughs> <laughs> so every time they are defaming the image like technical team is doing nothing or that kind of image na dekho yaar dekho politics to choti moti to har jagah chalti rehti hai mm-hmm. i think it is very important in a small setup that pe- there is complete transparency mm-hmm. that people are honest each other and that you have like i mentioned frank conversations and candid conversations because a lot of the stuff which you know you start we, when people start calling politics is a result of a lack of communication and a lack of transparency mm-hmm. and people working on different objectives so their goals are not aligned so it is important to ensure that the goals are aligned and that people work towards a common goal if people have different goals they have different objectives you know there is bound to be politics right so whoever is a leader has to ensure that everybody knows what they are working for right what the big goal for the team is and what we have done in pod in the pod system the cross functional teams i mentioned we've told everybody you succeed together you fail together agar ye goal meet nahi hua aap sabki rating kara hai goal meet ho gaya sabki rating achhi hai so that is works for us thanks yeah thanks i think stop I I I'm I'll, I'll be outside for a few minutes we can chat outside. Yeah. Okay. To felicitate Mr. Obroy, let's have on the stage the editor in chief Entrepreneur India and APAC Miss Ritu Maria. That was a captivating keynote i must say where the world is evolving exponentially sir your word sets perseverance for all of us a token of regard and immense respect on the behalf of entrepreneur india to you sir we have with us mr hitesh obroy the co-promoter md and ceo infoedge india limited 